Welcome to uh, the third and final Lunch and Learn talk about, for, uh, about security uh, as part of uh, October Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, with us today we have Jeff Lilliscar. He's the Director of Customer Protection within Microsoft's Customer uh, Support Services. Uh, Jeff's been at Microsoft about 25 plus years a uh, in a variety of roles, uh, sales roles as well as uh, support roles, most recently focused on online uh, safety across both the enterprise and the consumer offerings. Uh, and his job is really to, to protect customers from unwanted and harmful uh, ex exposure to online uh, materials. And with that, Jeff, I would like to extend my thanks to you coming across to join us uh, and welcome you to the city of Seattle and turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Andrew, for having me. Um, super great to reconnect um, and get down here and, and share a little bit uh, uh, about uh, my world and, and what I've been uh, sharing with customers for a bit now. The, the journey at Microsoft for me has, has been quite um, an interesting one. Uh, I found myself uh, over the last couple years really involved in more of this online safety uh, space that focuses uh, more on the commercial, uh, excuse me, more on the, uh, the consumer side of the house and less on the commercial. So from an enterprise uh, premier customer um, perspective, I, I still work over there on, on vulnerabilities and security updates and some of that space. But most of my time is really around our consumer offerings, um, Skype, OneDrive, Outlook, uh, and those that are uh, credentialed um, with Microsoft end users. Thank you. Um, so this, this talk is going to be, a lot of it's kind of common sense that, that you're going to go, oh yeah, I, I knew that. Um, so hopefully it just reinforces some of those things that you already knew. Uh, maybe I'll be able to share some new things, uh, provide some insights into what we're seeing in the ecosystem, um, and, and also uh, answer, answer questions um, as they come up, if there's something hot. Um, otherwise, maybe at the end I'll have some time. So uh, this is, like I said, something I've, I've done a couple times. Uh, it, it gets updated periodically uh, depending on uh, the audience and also as situations change. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to identify scams, what those look like, a little bit about how to avoid scams and tips on those. And selfishly, I'm from Microsoft, uh, one of our kind of agendas through these is to educate uh, our customers and, and just the general um, public on the threat of technical support scams. Those have been uniquely um, harmful to Microsoft and our customers. Uh, so we do spend some time talking about that. And a lot of the kind of nefarious activity that I'll be talking about potentially leads up to a tech support scam. Uh, so we'll kind of tell that story as we go along. So this is a little bit gratuitous, uh, I, I admit, uh, but we like to ask this question just to uh, in engage folks. Um, you know, who, who, who's most at risk, right? Who's most likely? Um, so I do have some, some numbers for you, but really the short answer, anyone online, right, is, is, is going to be exposed at some level. Um, so whether you're, whether you're doing mobile, whether you're on a PC, whether you're on a, a Mac, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you're, you're exposed if you're in the, on the public internet at some, at some point. Um, I also like to say at this point that yes, I'm from Microsoft, and so I'm certainly Windows-centric and Edge-centric, so a lot of my displays and examples will be focused around the Microsoft technologies. That said, the principles are universal, right? Whether you're using Chrome, Android, an iPhone, uh, the, the, the same safety principles apply everywhere, even though a setting might be called something a bit different or a service might be called something different. Uh, the principles are, are generally universal and, and good things to be aware of. So we've spent some time also researching this, uh, largely around the investment we've made in technical support scams, and we found that 66 out of 100 people, uh, and this was this is about 18 months, two years old now, um, had experienced some sort of a scam, uh, and that that could be online, phone, um, pop-ups that we'll talk about, uh, malware or, or spoofing or phishing, all, all the things that that we'll cover. It could be any one of those things. Um, what's really scary is that. 18% or so of those people that had exposed to something actually bit, actually took the next steps 
uh, to expose themselves further um, into uh, downloading malware, um, visiting other websites that may be harmful, um, giving ransomware remote access or scammers remote access, um, or providing actual payment. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about that as well. Um, the, the kind of the demographic breakup um, is here you can see about half um, are um, 18 to 34 uh, and then a smattering of, of uh, across the board. So a couple years ago when we did some initial research, we found that the senior community was, was being more victimized. Uh, so five-ish years ago, they stood out a bit more in the tech, tech scam, uh, tech support scam space especially, but we've seen that shift quite a bit. And I'll talk about some of the technologies that the adversaries are using that have, have driven that um, some. Uh, but for the most part, if you look at this, the people who are online the most, uh, most engaged, uh, are most trusting possibly of the internet um, and the services it provides are also the most likely uh, to be scammed or be victims of some sort of a exposure. So we'll cover some of the common approaches that, that folks would use and I'll, I'll branch off a little bit on each one of these. Uh, so web browsers, there's a plethora of those available uh, that provide a variety of different um, types of capabilities and security measures. Good old email, right, been around forever and it will be around forever, uh, so we still need to be smart about it. And I know enterprises and governments certainly have um, uh, services in place to help protect us as employees, uh, but there's also things that we can be smart, uh, smart about just as general consumers. Social media and online chat, we could spend the rest of the day just talking about that one topic alone. That's super close to my heart in a lot of the work I do with child exploitation online. Um, and that's just a huge problem um, that I'll, I'll, I'll dabble in some of that commentary as we go. Uh, the purpose of this is more around the, the scamming um, of it. And then good old fashioned phone calls, whether it's um, the IRS calling, uh, looking for some money you owe them and they've got the FBI on the way if you don't give them some money, um, to the tech support scams that we've been battling. Uh, the, the phone is still a viable option. Yes, Andrew. I get a lot of Chinese uh, spam, Chinese language spam. Sure. What's that all about? Like just in your inbox? Uh, no, or, on the phone. Oh, on the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have no idea. Um, so Andrew said, indicating that he's getting a lot of, of phone calls um, that, that seem to be Chinese oriented or, or somewhere. Um, actually, no idea about that. Okay angle. Um, I know we've seen a lot of movement out of India with these scammers um, because of the law, um, uh, the legal action that the Indian government's been trying to take the last couple of years. Um, so maybe you've kind of given me a tip on where they've gone a little bit. So the, so the comment was that during flight reservations and ticketing, it seems like there's some, some, some fraud being attempted in that environment. Not fraud. I think it was continuous, so they did not take my, you know, I signed up, I thought the intention was to sign up for the oh. flight, but they just signed up for that. So gotcha. Flight. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. Um, good. So phone calls. Uh, yeah, phone calls, right? We just got lot, lots of good inf insight on phone calls. Um, so web browsers, so we, we talked about this a little bit. Um, the good old traditional malware, um, so viruses, worms, uh, things that have been around forever uh, and have generally good awareness. Um, so they'll be trying to infect you with those things for, for other purposes. Um, sometimes just damage or disable. Uh, we often see this might be more likely to occur with bad malware when they, they're trying to do something um, nefarious or, um, or under the covers and, and they break something. They typically don't want to do that, right? They don't want you to know they're there. Um, but sometimes it's purposeful and we'll talk about um, ransomware a bit where that is uh, uh, the main thrust of their activity. And then fake technical support. Uh, which has um, affected every vendor, uh, with Microsoft being um, certainly one of the most affected over the last several years. So examples in a web browser. So I talked a little bit about this trend away from kind of the senior community um, to the broader community, and, and this has somewhat mirrored the investment that the, um, the adversaries or, or um, the bad guys have been doing in, in technology. So 
the premise of the good old fashioned phone call is still here. It's underneath it. A lot of it is good old fashioned social engineering. They are trying to manipulate you to do something. Often this isn't super technically sophisticated, um, but it's meant to get your emotions, to, to trigger you in a, uh, to a response that avoids you overthinking or being pragmatic about the decisions you're going to make. So what ha we've seen a lot now is these pop-ups. So they'll, um, they still call, but now you'll also find uh, if, if, if you slip into something or an ad is corrupt on a site you're on, they might be able to sneak in a pop-up that its whole purpose is to get you to proactively call them. So now it's still a phone call, but you're doing all the work, right? So they've given you a pop-up, they provided a phone number, um, and off you go. There's um, uh, lot, lots of reasons for this uh, and why it works, um, but the simplicity of it really is, is at its core, right? You're having a problem, something's wrong with your computer, a pop-up presents itself that warns you of something even more nefarious, and there's the phone number. Just, a, just an easy call and I can get it fixed. Uh, so super effective um, and has led to some of the scale um, in this space. Um, you'll also see, and this, this technique's been around for a while on different forms. I think it was heavily used in advertising originally online. Well, they'll try to get you to click on some part of the form uh, to close it or, or to move away from it when in fact they're bringing you further into the scam or into the ad or in the, into the environment. Um, so for example, this, this would not be uncommon. You go to close uh, the, the pop-up or, or the site or whatever is being shared um, and it takes you another level deeper warning you that the situation is actually even worse than you may have originally thought um, and now you really need to call and this one of course is doing um, a good job of, of trying to mimic what might be a legitimate look of feel of a, uh, a legitimate site um, even maybe looking like a Microsoft uh, Defender product of some type where you might have additional trust uh, to go ahead and, and make that phone call, especially if you had no preconceived notions that that wasn't something that was kind of built in and offered, uh, we do see that you know when, when you're when you're doing doing some um, interactions with consumers, they want things to be easier, they want things to be presented to them. So a lot of times this can be seen as a convenience that makes sense for a company to provide, when in fact it's just kind of using it to uh, bring us into a deeper scam. So this is also a technique that kind of gets you kind of stuck in the environment where you click, click, and it just keeps looping back to the same uh, pop-up, um, and you can't get out of it. The browser locks, and now you're stuck, and all that you have is the pop-up with the phone number on it. Um, with those, killing the browser, um, getting out of that situation is really the best option. The good old Control-Alt-Delete in Windows will pull up the task manager if you're familiar with that, and you can close that service. Um, your other, uh, and any other browsers um, and in, in, in the Windows environment will work the same. Um, and other services, you can just kill the browser is really your only way out as they lock that. And there are some protections now I'll, I'll talk to um, that browsers are trying to provide that, that kind of get ahead of this. Um, but this is still uh, possible and still effective. This one's really good. Um, so what they'll do is they'll force your, your browser into full screen mode to make it appear like it's no longer a browser and now it's actually your, your environment itself. Uh, so so kind of thinking you're, you're getting a glimpse into your actually uh, PC environment versus a simple um, web page. And that's just to try to make it um, more salacious and more exciting. And, and this one is really good. If you, if you, if you can look at it, um, you can see that it actually has a, um, a real uh, Microsoft support site. Interestingly enough, this is using a Russian example. I don't think that's on purpose. Um, I think that's just a, um, a good example that we have. Um, but you'll see if we break this out that um, the real um, browser um, header is, is still there behind the scenes, um, but they've used a, an image to overlay it to try to hide that from you. Uh, so again, that you're stuck and you take some action uh, that you wouldn't normally take. And here's another example of the kind of the um, 
the, the, the blue screen of death um, trigger, I guess. If you're a longtime Windows user, then this is something that, that you may have experienced historically, and they'll use this as well to try to trigger some response from you that may not be the wisest choice. Um, again, this goes into full screen mode and provides some sort of a system looking error or some sort of a, um, you know, um, you know a scary message to try to get you to go ahead and dive in further. We also have the fake crash. So this is trying to mimic that your environment has crashed, you're out of luck, you're stuck, uh, and boy, you need to call to go ahead and get support. Um, before typically they'll have mo they'll have comments here like you're losing your data. Um, sometimes the, um, the, uh, the 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 real creative ones will suggest that they found illegal content on your computer, therefore it's been shut down, uh, and and you need to call to have that taken care of. Uh, and any number of ways they'll go uh, to try to get you to take advantage of this. So. For some of us, um, if, if we see those, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of maybe IT pros, we're, we're savvy pro consumers that, you know, these may not, you're thinking, well, this might not affect me. Um, and, and it might not. Um, however, think of your extended family. So just in the last 18 months since I've been uh, delivering variations of this presentation, um, I've had people, my, my direct um, uh, family and, and, and close friends, um, affected by this, and as you can imagine, I, I'm not quiet about these risks to friends and family. I evangelize this stuff quite heavily to all of them. It drives them crazy. Um, the deal is if you call me for tech support, you have to listen to my advice. Um, but, the, and this is an absolute true story. Um, last year, my father-in-law, and I have permission to share this, my father-in-law calls me up, it was actually a ho the holidays a year ago, late at night, well past his bedtime, like 11 o'clock. And he, 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 he's, he's on the phone, he's upset, he needs help, something's wrong with his computer. And I was like, you know, calm down. And, and I hear this beeping in the background. And he goes, yes, I can't get through to the phone number. I go, what phone number? He goes, well, you know the phone number they flash up when your computer breaks? I've been trying to call it for a half hour and I can't get through. Can you help me? And I'm, I'm going, oh, you know. Try not to pull my hair out. Yes, Dad, um, that's a fake phone number, and that's a scam, and we are super thankful that they were busy or off tonight because you would have been scammed. The thing I love about this, this attempt uh, on my father-in-law, and it worked perfectly for him, not only did they give the visuals of it, they sounded his computer speaker in an alarm mode. So he just shut down. I mean, he just freaked and, and just started doing whatever they said. Um, so I was super thankful that he wasn't able to get through. Um, and I haven't had another call in about a year. So I'm super happy about that. Um, but then on the other end, my daughter's roommate at college, I unfortunately didn't, didn't get to her soon enough, but she paid 100 bucks for support. So, you know, kind of a struggling college student, got one of these notices on her computer at school off the, off the uh, university network. Um, saw the number, called it, gave her credit card, and 100 bucks later, um, she has no solution, but she's out 100 bucks. So um, these are very real and can affect our friends and family, if not us our, ourselves. Um, so, so make sure that, um, that, that you're, you're kind of you know, taking advantage and, and moving the message forward uh, whenever you can. Because um, these are real and, and they're a um, you know, million, million dollar business. And hopefully, with some of the stories I just shared, you can see that this is not just a technical or a technology abuse. This is really good old-fashioned social engineering, right? They're trying to get you to do something based on a relationship or an emotion. So one thing I like to say is when you think about th this connection that they're asking you to make with them, um, if somebody was on your doorstep at your house screaming at you to give them money or screaming at you to let them help you for some reason, would you open that door? Most of us, absolutely not, right? We're, we're calling the police, we're leaving the door locked. Um, but in this online environment, we're much more willing to take, kind of take that step um, and let them into our environment, um, which, which puts us at risk. 
So this this is super interesting, and this one actually makes the news quite a bit, uh, especially when it hits um, uh, governments, um, cities, um, law enforcement departments. Uh, it, you, you can catch them all over the world um, happen, happening um, uh, consistently. Um, so this is not unlike typical uh, malware or ransomware that would infect you, um, with the exception that it typically is actually encrypting your data and your hard drive. We do see some that provide a message that says it's ransomware and you're encrypted, um, and they're kind of faking it. They, they haven't really done the hard work to encrypt, but the vast majority of them are actually using industry standard encryption. So at Microsoft, we get customers calling, hey, I've been hit by this ransomware attack, Microsoft. I need you to unencrypt my hard drive that's now been locked, right? It's like, you know, sorry. Um, not not possible, right? That that encryption is, is standard industry. Uh, there's no breaking it, right? If you're encrypted, you're encrypted, um, and you're at risk of 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 paying the ransom. Uh, there's been some recorded success of people actually paying the ransom, um, but certainly the typical recommendation is no, uh, don't pay. Uh, there's certainly no guarantee you're going to get data back. And there's a likelihood that by paying, that you kind of tip them off that, okay, here's somebody, government, consumer, whatever, enterprise, that doesn't back up their, their files, right? That you know have no great backup. So you're more likely to get scammed again, um, or even further exploited in that, that single transaction. Some of these scenarios um, and adversaries are, are so sophisticated, um, they actually have support services set up where if you can't figure out how to use Bitcoin, for example, to pay them, um, they will send you over to their support online chat um, and they'll walk you through how to do Bitcoin. If that doesn't work, they'll send you down to 7-Eleven um, to, to, to buy um, some gift cards from somewhere that they can cash in. Uh, so they're going to go a variety of ways to try to get the money out of you. Um, and, and some of them certainly for uh, the, the, the small business uh, is, is super tempting to go down that path. Um, here's another example just showing you um, that common technique of providing that information, saying you're locked uh, and that you need to call. One more of those. There we go. So before I, I, I kind of go um, to some more safety tips, I'll stop on ransomware for a second. There's not really a great way for a consumer to, to stop ransomware from occurring other than good normal hygiene, right? Keep your operating system up to date with the latest updates, the latest security updates. Um, and it'll talk about turning all that on to auto, automatic updates. Same with your browsers, um, same with your applications. Any, any trusted source, keep those up to date. Uh, you're going to be uh, more secure. Um, also, um, cloud storage services. Uh, Microsoft has OneDrive. It does not protect you from ransomware. It actually is just as exposed to ransomware as your local device because you're connected and synchronizing files. Um, what, what it can do in a, in a business setting is restore historical files. So if you're on um, Office 365 for business, for example, there are some recovery options, even though it's still not a proactive protection. That's just good hygiene up front. Um, so note that. Um, so for consumers, back up to an offline storage device that's not connected. If you want to put it in your post office box, if you want to put it in your, fire, you know, your, your fireproof safe, um, or just in your desk, the only real way um, is the way that it's always been, have um, a, a disconnected backup uh, available. Um, and you might only do that to your most sensitive files. Uh, maybe your personal pictures comes to mind as something people get most upset about. Um, in, the, in the enterprise commercial space, there, there's much more um, uh, at scale protections for that, but as consumers, it's keeping your hygiene um, and keeping up to date on all your updates is really the best thing you can do. So some safety tips. I, tips. I just, I just kind of tipped on the big one. Keep your operating systems up to date. Obviously with Microsoft, that's Windows 10. Um, that's a, a pretty regular cycle. Uh, for those that are in the security space, we know that on the second Tuesday of every month, Microsoft ships security updates. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to have your automatic updates on. Uh, just allow those to install. Uh, when you're not there, um, let the system reboot. Uh, for consumers, that's the best way to do it. 
uh, uh, for enterprise and commercial customers, they have uh, obviously more purposeful uh, deployment plans uh, that they would snap to, uh, but I would encourage everybody to look at um, your testing and deployment and be as aggressive as you can in deploying Microsoft security updates and those updates from any of your key vendors um, on operating systems or applications. Um, and obviously the browser um, is a big one. Um, for us as consumers, make sure you're protecting yourself with the built-in protections in the browsers themselves. Um, they all typically have pop-up um, protections, lots of great privacy settings uh, that, that can help you in other ways. So take full advantage of those. Um, and most modern browsers, this is another reason it's important to, to keep updated on your browsers. So not only on their regular updates and maintenance, but also on the most recent versions of those. Because the technology is really advancing fast along these lines. And all the browser vendors um, are, you know, it's in our best interest to make the best and most secure environments and platforms for our customers. So, you know, I, I know I talked to people who, you know, loved IE8 or something, right? Um, or, or, you know, still people on Windows 7, uh, you know, th that's great. Um, and I like it to liken that to, yes, I love that as a hobby. I also have a Model T in the garage. And I can drive that. It has no airbags, doesn't have ABS. There is no safety measures in that, even though it's still a car that can get me from point A to point B. So I look at the software the same way. Yes, I can have nostalgia for an old operating system or an old application. I can love it. I can think it's fast. I can think it's the best. Um, but I am giving up modern safety protections if I'm not keeping up to speed. Um, and so the Windows Defender smart screen is something that's built into um, um, to Edge. Um, through the Defender uh, technology, um, and that'll help protect and watch for some of these things. And that's also getting smarter, watching for indicators of malware, as well as watching for hints of ransomware. So all those things have signatures that, they can, that we can watch for. And at Microsoft, we have a broad um, uh, kind of um, um, environment that we can learn a ton from and feed that back into our tools uh, um, and services to protect customers. Protection from dialog loops, I mentioned this as a, um, a potential vector earlier on. Uh, so now we can watch for those system errors that keep popping up and repeat themselves um, as, as a fake way to get into you uh, and try to protect you from those. Um, and I mentioned the kind of control alt delete to get out of a browser scenario, so that still works. Uh, but also we've added some capabilities within the browser session itself. If you get into one of those environments um, and, and you shut down, what used to happen is when you came back, out of convenience, we would put you on the, the website that you just got out of. So we would allow you to delete or control, delete, reboot, come back in to Edge or IE, and we'd put you right into the scammer site. Um, so now there's a fresh start option, so it'll clean that up for you and give you a safe landing. Uh, similar to the full screen mode, we now have protections in there. Again, stay current and you'll get these added features. And this is true for Chrome, Safari, any of the browsers. Get their latest, get the latest technology. Um, it's really going to be the best for you. Uh, we talked about the close button um, and obviously making sure that's the real one. Um, never call the number. We had some good stories on that. Um, so let's move on a little bit to the technical support. Um, scam area, um, we see a lot of exposure just in, um, in search indexes and in search engines where people are looking for Microsoft support. Um, so please be sensitive of uh, what you're looking at when it comes to uh, being online and looking at those ads. Look for the authoritative um, information um, and only call those. And for Microsoft, you can go directly to the support.microsoft.com contact us website. And I'll also pivot on that to suggest that um, if you get, um, we'll go to the, the, we'll get to the email here. Um, so search-based ads, similar thing. We don't pay for those ads. Um, so watch for non-Microsoft addresses. Look for the authentication of, of the support. And this is for any vendor, whether it's looking for Microsoft, Dell, Apple. Uh, these fake ads will be across industry um, and, and trying to get you to click on them or call their number, and then you're back into the whole support scam loop. Uh, the support scam loop uh, will try to social engineer you to allow them to remotely connect to your computer. Uh, and then they have more exposure to their environment. Um, and, and that's why once you've been exposed, uh, we would recommend a rebuild. 
So let's get to the, I want to get to the email. Here we go. Um, so email scams. This is the, by far the, the, the most prevalent vector that, uh, that, that adversaries get into enterprise and commercial accounts um, and as well as, as consumers. It, it, it's easy to spoof email. It's easy to get information out there. Um, if you see, this is super easy for somebody to do. If you're just passing by quickly, you know, npl.com, I don't know, that could be a Microsoft subsite. Um, but no, that's a fake address. Um, strange characters, uh, watch in the body of the email uh, for kind of non-polished, especially when you're coming from a big, like Apple, Microsoft, Google, right? We have lots of marketing and comms people that clean that up for us. Um, you're not going to see this kind of stuff um, in our official communications typically. Uh, you'll see the social engineering aspect come into this as well. So even in writing, they're going to be a little bit edgy, a little harassing, a little threatening, whereas a real email uh, from an actual enterprise partner or company wouldn't have that kind of image or that kind of tone to it. Blurry images, slam dunk, bad graphics, uh, misleading links. This is uh, one of my favorite, um, Microsoft spelled with an R and an N. Um, if I'm in the back of the room right now, I couldn't tell you the difference. Um, so a, a great way to fool you into thinking that's a legit site, it's a, lit, a legit URL, uh, something along those lines, um, really easy to do. So here's a real mail example. Uh, for Microsoft, it's really authoritative. Um, you can look at it. Your personal information is protected. So if you're getting a, a, a message of some type from Microsoft, we know you. We have your account information. So we're going to try to give you enough trust that we, that we know you and have it, but we're also going to protect that from further exposure. So that's what we would use there with the email address that you can look at and go, oh yeah, that's me, um, but I'm not being overly exposed in that particular uh, mail. Non-threatening language, uh, and if you hover, you know, always you check the URLs, um, links to real websites. So similar, look for the warning signs, um, and really, don't call those phone numbers, please. Uh, and also, even when you get an email from Microsoft or a legitimate website that, or, or a partner, whether it's Comcast or Wells Fargo or, who, or, or the, the city of Seattle, right, um, and they're driving you to a website, I always recommend break out of the email, type in the URL yourself into your browser so there's no way for it to be spoofed or otherwise mimicked on the back end and you know exactly where you're going. Um, good old-fashioned donut open links um, and, and, um, and attachments. This has been a long-standing vector that still works, um, especially uh, uh, in, in some of the enterprise and commercial scams we see. Um, use all your settings. Again, stay up current on your technologies and take advantage of those. Um, and, and obviously only give your information to people you trust. So online social media. Um, all the principles we just talked about apply. Don't call the phone number. They're going to try to get you phone numbers in the same ways we just described. They're going to try to entice you into deals, um, whether it's a, a prince in Nigeria um, or a, a pub in Ireland. Doesn't matter. Um, they're all scams. Uh, just be sensitive to those. Um, also watch from, you know, this is standard two in social media. Um, and I will take a, a quick sidebar here. Um, if we have kids, be extra sensitive about your kids in social media platforms these days. I won't go into great detail. I do this in other parts of my life. Um, but go do a search on social media platforms for kids um, and risks of those. And just do, you know, go to Google, go to Bing, um, and take a look at the social platforms your, 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 your tweens, your eight-year-olds are using. A lot of these are unregulated, um, not great parent controls. Um, and are just wide open um, environments to badness, I would say. So please be sensitive to what your kids are, are, are looking at on their phones um, because th there are some known risk factors that are well documented. Um, and these are outside of our, our normal social media platforms. These ones are targeted at kids uniquely. Th something that we would never even think of spending time on, they could spend all day on. Um, so please be sensitive to that because um, they, they can be exploited as well. Um, the trust relationship, uh, this is a great conversation in my senior communities where we do have, um, you know, a singles uh, are, are prevalent in that community uh, and they're getting online for the first time, wham, they, they are ripe for the picking. Um, when their kids, you know, now set them up with a computer to stay in touch with the family. Now they're all over Facebook, all over Instagram. They're getting friended left and right with people they don't know and they're super excited. 
and potentially victimized. Um, and the rest of us just go into it knowingly, but uh, um, especially risk population. So social media, I mentioned earlier, um, on, and browsers, watch your privacy settings, um, watch what you share and link to online, uh, trust people you trust, and if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. We talked about the phone scams. Um, yes, don't call, it's support, it's a scam. Safety tips, uh, Microsoft never makes unsolicited calls to consumers. So if you get a phone call, somebody saying they're Microsoft, they're not. Um, so just hang up. Um, do not purchase their software services. And here's that thing I mentioned earlier, never give remote control of your computer to them. Um, not only can they take advantage of you in that environment at that time and scare you and get money from you, uh, they will record you for future use. So I had a gentleman I discussed with, he was very excited, he had a, a super fantastic um, support professional who'd been supporting him for a couple years. I mean, he wanted to know, he, after my talk, he was a little worried. Well, it turns out he had been scammed several years ago where somebody had called him and told him that they detected a printer problem um, and he had agreed to have it fixed. Um, and then they came back every quarter or so um, warning him of more issues he was having. So over the last couple of years, he had paid these folks thousands of dollars in a repeated ongoing business relationship. And really this company may or may not have done anything technically illegal because they were providing a service, updating his drivers, updating windows, doing stuff that might have legit value, but on the premise that it was a, it was a, a virus or malware or a, a something broken. Um, so there's the ultimate answer. Hang up on those phone calls. Um, so as we round down, uh, you can look at some of this content on Report a Scam up on Microsoft. You can also, uh, um, at that site, report these scams to us as well. So, so while we can't take a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction with you uh, to solve your particular fraud, uh, we, you know, we, we ask you to go ahead and contact law enforcement. Um, but we do take your information, we track it, um, and then we'll look at the phone numbers you provide, we'll look at any of the URLs, any of the details, um, and then we aggregate all that data from across our ecosystem that's reported to us, and we'll take action at a higher level. Um, we'll go after um, um, higher level operations at the source versus um, trying to help you get a refund, which we can't really do. So with that, I want to thank everybody for your time uh, and, and hopefully shared um, some new information. Um, if not, uh, hopefully a good refresher on great practices to take for you and your family. So appreciate it. Thank you. Any, any questions? Yeah, happy to. Sure, so the question was how to keep kind of per professional and personal identities um, separate. So I'll do a, a complete blatant plug and say, your professional life is on LinkedIn. That's it. Um, so, uh, but there's some truth to that. That's what I do, right? I, 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 I use the, uh, a professional platform for that. Um, I don't have a great answer that, and that varies greatly from government to government, company to company on what they expect. Um, as kind of a tone of my whole talk here is I would always err on the side of caution. Um, and over the years I have gotten personally, I would say very cautious about what I share and where I share. Um, so social platforms where I may have work friends on there, um, I have kind of distanced myself from because of that overlap that you, that you kind of just suggested. Um, so number one, what's the policy of your company, your enterprise? I would just follow that. Um, and I tend to keep any social personal stuff um, on other platforms and not represent Microsoft on those. And then on LinkedIn, on my Microsoft persona. That's how I do it. Any other questions? Thank you so much.